of that. A man after God's own heart who knew that these, this subtle reminder that he thought he was giving to God was really a reminder to himself. Have you ever worshiped God and acted like God didn't know? Probably not. Did you know you're awesome? He knows, but we tell him anyway. You know why? Not only to acknowledge him, but to remind us. That's what worship is. It's a reminder of who God is and who we are to him. God, you are awesome, and I'm your little buddy. God, you are amazing, and I'm your son. God, you're, uh, you're the stupendous, and I'm your servant. It's a reminder. Not only are we speaking to God glory and honor and power and giving him all that, more, all that we can that he is due, but we're reminding ourselves of who we serve. He's a mighty God. I got to hurry up right now. But this is so good. The aroma. Hmm. I, I got another scripture. This is so good. Ephesians chapter 5. You've probably read this one before. Ephesians chapter 5 says this, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Ephesians 5 says that Jesus' sacrifice was not savory as the First Testament says it. First Testament says his, his aroma, the aroma of the sacrifices were savory. Every time you read it, it says savory. But when you get to the New Testament, it says Jesus' sacrifice was sweet. You know why? Because you always start with the savory, but you end with the sweet. If you knew what I said right then, you would have shouted just for a second. You start with bacon in the morning, hey. But at the end, you have dessert. Jesus topped it off. And sin entered world through one man. Jesus brought salvation. His death on the cross was the last sacrifice that was needed because it paid the price for all of humanity. And all will know salvation through that one Jesus. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Sorry, I had to get a little chocolatey on y'all for a second. right? And grab my towel and start waiting the... <laughs> That's the way my church is back home. We got some of the craziest white folk in the world. It's so fun. But did you catch something at the very beginning of this? The Bible says this. It says to walk as children. Jesus described it like this. If you're going to come to the kingdom of God, you have to come as a child. Nothing smells better than a baby. Hold up. A clean baby. Nothing. Nothing smells better. And you know what? The Smithsonian Institute did a 40-year study on the aroma of a baby and the effect it has on its child, on its parents. Did you know that babies' smell affects their parents dramatically? Did you know that? You probably do. If you have kids, you already know. Sniffing their little heads, there's something about them. It's incredible. And the Smithsonian Institute did a 40-year study on that. And they discovered that the aroma of a child has a decided effect on the parent. It is akin to drug addiction. The aroma on the mother is the same as eating a delicious meal or complete and total sexual satisfaction. Which is why dad and me and we all prayed that that baby turns 13 and starts stinking as quick as possible. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen, brother. I'm here for you. Shoot. <laughs> They said that when, when a parent smells their child, it evokes a response that is bifold. That is bonding and service. Bonding, you draw that baby, he's, he's hugging, he's, uh, I want to hug him more. And then service, I'll do anything, I'll go anywhere, I'll buy anything. That's why we lose our minds when we have kids. Before we had kids, we were normal. Then we had kids and we start spending money on our kids that we never would spend on ourselves. Baby clothes are never on sale. I went to the outlet mall. They had baby Air Jordans and they were $90. How are you going to buy $90 shoes for a baby who can't even walk yet? <laughs> Grandma, you're worse. 
You've completely lost your inhibitions. You have no inhibitions. Grandma, she hugs the baby. She sniffs the baby. I could just eat this little baby. I'm going to nibble on her ears. You say things that you would never say because that baby has got you. It's crazy. It's like we're little, pardon my English, but it's like we're crackheads and the baby's the drug dealer. (laughs) Baby's like, take a sniff now. The next one's going to cost you a bottle of milk. Go. And we're like, yes, I will. It's unbelievable. Bonding and service. Jesus best described you as being born again, a baby of God. You know why Jesus wanted us to understand that we're babies? Because when we think of ourselves in God, we don't put ourselves in the right place. We keep putting ourselves as humans and men and women, but to God, you're a goo goo gaga. And he wants you to understand that you are not in control, but you're going to win. You know why? Babies are never in control, but babies always win. Always. You could be playing the the toughest game on earth with a baby. You could play chess with a a, a nine-month-old baby. Guess what? Nine-month-old baby going to win. You know why? Because you love your baby. You'll do anything. You'll lose on purpose. Your baby starts running towards the stairs like, (laughs) you're like, stop. But what do you do? You run over there, dive on the ground, grab the baby, put it on your, on your chest, and roll down the stairs like this. Baby's on your lap. <laughs> You're like, I love you. Ow, 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 ow. I love you. Ow. You got in the parking lot today. Your baby had three choices. Number one, come into church where this church does an amazing job with your babies, loving them, leading them, serving them, growing them up with you. Or... Go in the grass and play, real fun. Or run through the parking lot and try to get run over. What do they do? Run the parking lot and try to, "Ah!" and then you start chasing them. They're like, "Ah!" and what's funny is we're frustrated, but they don't know. Neither do we ever tell them. We're chasing them. We pick up, you naughty little baby. Wee! And then you turn them around, they're smiling so big. There's nothing you can do. They've got you. They're little sneaks, man. You ever, you ever try to sleep and your baby's like, ah, ah, ah. And then you come in the room and they're looking at you like this. One tear in their eye. <laughs> and you're so tired, but what do you do? I know I'm not supposed to do this, but you're so stinking cute. That's how God sees you. You're his baby. There's nothing he won't do for you. In fact, if if you struggle with this belief that that, that you smell good to him, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he provided. He gave his only begotten son that whomever shall believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He's bonded to you and he has served you. He did not send his son in the world to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You're his baby. And the quicker we realize that, the quicker we understand that he's going to bring us through whatever struggle, whatever storm, whatever pain, whatever problem, whatever issue, whatever uh, 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 obstacle that we're facing. He's going to bring us through it because you're his baby. I got to hurry up. I I do. There's there's one more passage I want to give you. It's so good. It's in Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, this is what it says. One of my favorite scriptures. Now, thanks be to God who always, somebody say always. Always. Say it again, always. Always. Who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us, hold up, diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. What? For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one we're the aroma of death leading to death, the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Wait, hold up. What you're saying, preacher, is that I Have an aroma? Yeah. Scripture says simply this. There is no distinguishing to your God, your Father in heaven, between your aroma right now and Jesus. Not only are you Jesus' brother and sister, 
but you're God's baby. You're his baby sister. You're his baby brother. And the father says, I can't distinguish between Jesus and them in my love. There's no distinguishing. Do you know how big that is? That totally changes our understanding of our purpose and our identity. That not only are you God's baby, that he loves you just like Jesus. That he loves you just like his perfect son. I am not Jesus. I'm a bad baby. I'm a naughty baby. Some people would say, you, you know, when you're the naughty baby, you're the black sheep. I don't know why the bad sheep have to be the black sheep. There's plenty of bad white sheep out there too. But man, there's no distinguishing to your father in heaven. No matter what you've done, his love for you is that of the same of his own son. There's no distinguishing. Wow. Oh, man, I could go for hours just on that revelation. Just on that. That the covenant establishes an aroma of anointing. An aroma of, of identity. And get this. An aroma of hierarchy. That Jesus is above all and over all, but we identify even in aroma. Why is this so important? Because shepherds, that's why. Come on, give me a piano player up here. Make me sound spiritual. Shepherds. All of you here that have sheep, that are shepherds, you already know. That if you have an abandoned sheep, a sheep whose, whose parent maybe was slaughtered or parent was injured, that the only way you can get a baby to suckle with a strange mother is aroma. And so what the shepherds will do is they'll shear the mother that they want to feed the baby. And they'll take the wool from the mother and slap it on the baby and duct tape it. It's so funny. They'll duct tape it on the baby for four days. That plays right into the Passover, but anyway. And they'll, they'll, they'll duct tape that, that, that wool on the baby and the baby will run around, yeah. Yeah. You know how little baby sheep are. They're hilarious. And finally, after four days of the mother going, hmm, smells like family. She'll let the baby suckle. As long as she smells the aroma. And then the, the, the shepherd or the, or the farmer will take the duct tape off the sheep. And from then on, that sheep is hers. So this aroma is an alliteration. That Jesus, when he healed Lazarus, was born, was reanimated. But when Jesus was resurrected, that we would be accepted into the family of God. And that there would be no distinguishing between the Father providing for his son, Jesus, and the Father taking care of us. So when things go wrong in your life, you need to know that your heavenly Father will provide, protect, and defend you. After all, nobody puts baby in the corner. God's going to take care of his baby. He's going to make sure that everything works out towards your good. Hmm. And finally, before we have this remarkable encounter moment, point number two, big gap between them, this point short. Remember your history. You got to know your identity and you got to know your history. This is a short point. The only reason is, you already know this lesson. This lesson is basically this. Has God ever failed you? No. Nah. People have failed me. Oh, man, all kinds of people. Man, leaders have failed me. Governmental, community, situation, family. Everybody's failed me at some point, but you know who's never failed me? Jesus. God has never failed me. He's never left me. He's never forsaken me. He's never turned his back on me. He hasn't tripped me, trapped me, or dumped me. He loves me, and he loves you. And there's nothing he won't do for you. He's crazy about you. That's why I made the t-shirts. Because I want Christians to know the truth about themselves, that you are God's favorite, that he's in love with you, and there's nothing he won't do for you. Nothing. You're not his man. You're not his woman. He doesn't expect you to do everything on your own. You're his baby. 
He wants to provide and take care of you. It's true. I want to swipe that cute little baby right there. Just swipe, just swipe. That's a high quality little white baby right there. High AA quality. But man, that's who you are to him. He's the ancient of days. You're his baby. How do we dip into our history? How do we understand it? That's why we worship. And that's what David did. He established his understanding and his reminding of covenant through an aroma of sacrifice. But I love this. Jesus, I'm sorry, David reminded himself of God's love and his place in God's kingdom through worship. While David was running for his life, get this, this is so cool. While David was running from his, for his life from his own son Absalom, the scripture says he wrote a song. He wrote, my, my iPad just froze up. He wrote Psalm 3 while he was running for his life. Do you know why? Worship is one of the most powerful reminders of our identity. And worship is one of the most powerful reminders of our history. Worship, we sing about what God has done in the past. We sing about who God is. And we sing about the fact that he is consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that if he came through for us before, baby, he's going to come through for us again. He won't leave us now. He didn't bring us this far to leave us. If we were going to die, we should have died a long time ago. No, he did all this to give us to, to give us an understanding of who we are of his love and where we're going to go is always going to be with him he's got the baby seat right now in his car and he's just waiting for you to take a seat he's going to drive you through the gates of victory and the gates of hell won't even prevail against you he wrote psalm 3 many are they lord who rise up against me Many are they who say of me, there is no hope for him in God. He writes this, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me, the glory and the lifter of my head. I to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. <laughs> I love that. He says, I don't fear of tens of thousands who come to me and are all around me. He goes, arise, O Lord, rescue me, O my God, for you've struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You've broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your glory is upon all your people. David knew <laughs> that God would come through because God doesn't fail. He's allergic to failure. That's so awesome. Can I pray for you? See, some of us today in this room are going through difficult times, and I want to pray with you that you would see that God is with you and that you will sense his presence around you and that he will walk you through this storm, through this struggle. Maybe your business is having trouble. Maybe your marriage is in trouble. Maybe your finances are in trouble. Maybe today, man, you got family issues like David. I want you to know that less than 40 days later, David marched right back into Jerusalem. His son was defeated, and he was victorious, and guessed who met him? at the gates of Judah Shimei the hater he goes I didn't mean what I said king I love you man and David goes I'm not going to kill you yet <laughs> he never did he never did God turned his hater into his celebrator I believe that as we walk in faith and live for God and remember who we are, remember why we're here, remember our history that God has never failed us, we'll start to turn people who used to be against us into loved ones and family members. You know why? Because they're going to see that this battle is not about humanity. This battle is for humanity. This battle, battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers. And we're going to love the people of our community and we're going to hate the sin that's trying to destroy them, but we're not going to stop loving them and reaching them and telling them the truth of God's love until they turn and they're saved just like we have been and we are being. Can I pray for you? I came 1,100 miles. I might as well. Will you bow your heads for just a moment? Maybe you're here right now and you're thinking, Alan, I'm going through a difficult time, a difficult season. Will you include me in your prayer? Yes, I will. If that's you, when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. As soon as you put it up, you can put it right back down. Are you ready? One, two, three. Lift it up. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yes, yes. 
we're family. We're going to pray together. Yes. Maybe you're here right now and you're thinking, Alan, you know what? I need a relationship with Jesus Christ. Will you pray for me that my relationship with Jesus would begin? Would you pray that my relationship with Jesus would get better? Maybe you have been holding out on God or or messing up and and you haven't given God your whole mind, your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole strength. And today you're like, I'm going to love God with all of me. Will you pray for me, preacher? Or maybe you want to start a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is your moment. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. And as soon as you put it up, you can put it right back down. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Throw it up. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, yes, awesome, awesome. How many of us have loved ones that need a relationship with God? Raise your hand for them as well. Yeah, me too, me too. Will you take a moment and grab your neighbor by the hand? And as soon as you grab their hand, then you can stand with us. Go ahead, grab their hand then you can stand and then look at him and say I got you we're family it's so wonderful to see a family of all dimensions here it's all awesome take that neighbor's hand and lift it up shoulder high we're going to pray for each other please don't lift your hands up higher than shoulder high because there's short people in here and they don't want to fly shoulder high Say this prayer with me right now. Say, Lord Jesus. Say it like this. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you for resurrecting from the dead. So I could have new life. I need your forgiveness to take away my sin. I confess today that I'm a sinner and you're the hero I need you oh God to have me in your family as I have you in mine now and forever in Jesus name now father I pray for my brothers my sisters in this room Lord so many of which Lord are going through difficult times and seasons And Lord, we've done a really good job of hiding it from the people around us and and not trying to worry them with our concerns. But Father, we know that you, as David wrote, we can cast our cares upon you because you yourself will take care of us. Father, I thank you that you you don't assign our care to some lackey or some angel. But Lord, you assign our care to the Father. And so Lord, I thank you that you're taking care of us. That Lord, there's a plan at work for us. For Lord God, you care You care, you care, you care. Father, I pray that you would provide your care to marriages, provide your care to finances, provide your care to educations and mindsets, provide your care to physical ailments and maladies for healing. Father, provide your care to those here that are going through difficult times and seasons emotionally, physically, Lord, spiritually, that you would bring us about complete and total victory. Father, I pray today that you would minister to our brothers and sisters, healing hearts and minds and restoring us as your children in Jesus name and everybody say this amen amen I want you to hug the person on your left and the person on your right and tell them this you're stuck with me for the rest of your life